Dear participants, a very warm welcome to this uh, lunch webinar. As president of the European Law Institute, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to this project kickoff webinar dedicated to digitalization of civil justice systems in Europe. In February 2023, the uh, European Law Institute Council decided to embark on a project on digitalization of civil justice systems in Europe. In the past decade, indeed, governments of all over Europe and beyond have invested in uh, digitalizing sorry, the justice system on a small or larger scale. Thus, the level of digitalization differs from country to country and within the EU. The primary purpose of this new ELI project is therefore to develop a set of principles which will derive fundamental rights from Article 6.1 uh, of the European Conven Convention on Human Rights and Article 47 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which provide with an over uh, overarching framework for improving the use of digital technology in the judiciary. The idea of this kickoff webinar is to present the project and give an opportunity for the co-reporters to receive specific inputs before they dive into the work together with their project team and advisors. It is also a way to recall to everyone that the European Law Institute has what is called a membership consultative committee, which brings together any member interested in this project. The MCC members can thus get a better understanding of the project, react to some draft at various stages of the project, and hand in their personal understandings or views on the subject. Therefore, do not hesitate to become an MCC member, and this can be done very easily just by sending an email to the uh, ELI secretariat. Our four Project co-reporters are Dori Reeling as lead reporter, Masoud Ahmed, Sandra Kramer, and Jerry Novak. They will start presenting their excellent project proposal and what they intend to produce as an outcome. Let me present them very shortly. So Dori uh, Reeling is the lead reporter of this project. She was a senior judge of the Ab Amsterdam District Court until she retired in 2018. Formerly, that is from 2004 to 7, she was a senior judicial reform specialist at the World Bank and IT program manager for the Netherlands judiciary. And she was actively involved in designing and building digital procedures for the civil courts in the Netherlands. With Chandra Kramer, is, uh, she is the associate reporter of this project and professor of civil justice at the Erasmus University Rotterdam and of private international law at Utrecht University in, in, in the Netherlands as well, of course, as well as deputy judge in the district court of Rotterdam. She was a reporter and a co-reporter of working groups resulting in the ELI UNIDRA Model European Rules of Civil Procedure of 2020. Masoud Ahmed, also associate reporter of this project and associate professor for, at the University of Leicester, Leicester. He had uh, recently been appointed to the Dispute Resolution Committee of the Law Society of England and Wales and is advising it on the impact of civil justice reforms, ADR, and digitalization on the legal profession. Jiri Novak, also associate reporter of this project and legal practitioner based in Prague, Czech Republic, with 20 years of experience in both civil and criminal uh, litigation. He is the chairman of the CCB's IT Law Committee since 2018 and a member of several other CCBE committees and of the European Criminal Bar Association. But before handing them the floor, let me just remind you that the chat function has been disabled. So you can and should put all your questions to the exceptional panelists of today uh, through the Q&A function. This is uh, on the below part of your screen. Please do not wait until the end uh, to pose your questions, but of course, we will answer all these questions orally at the end 
during the Q, Q and, uh, Q &R, uh, uh, session. Now let's start with our four core reporters and I hand over directly to uh, Dory Railing to introduce the project. Dory, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Pascal, uh, for that kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity not only to present our project, but for actually supporting uh, this project, which we think is important. So um, we, we decided beforehand that I will do a brief presentation with some slides, and then the other, my, my, my colleagues will all uh, um, have an opportunity to uh, uh, and expand upon what I've been telling you. So um, I'd like to start sharing my screen here. And this should be all right for all of you to see. So um, the, the, the project has, as, as Pascal said, has been um, taking some time to actually get going. So um, it, and it, right, it's good to remember that it's still early days because we, we just got started with our team. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we already know. And the first thing that I'd like to talk about is why we are doing this project. And the second thing is we know a little bit more about that now, is how we will actually try and do that. And the third topic will be what the project is going to deliver. So those three subjects. First, let's talk about why are we doing this project. Um, on the one hand, digitalization is welcomed as a justice value delivery, but on the other hand, we also know by now that it is very difficult. Um, opinion 14 of the Consultative Council of, Council of European Judges in 2011 already said that it is a tool to improve the administration of justice, so it's welcomed, but on the other hand, now, 12 years later, we know that results often disappoint, that there are failures and delays, things take a long time, and there is a lot of complexity and interdependencies which make developing and implementing information technology in justice systems difficult. So that's a kind of a yes or no. Um, why, are we, why, why are we doing this project? It's because we think that a set of overarching principles will actually help uh, dis digitalization and the debate about it in uh, justice systems in Europe. Uh, and mainly also to take away the focus from efficiency, which is what it has been for a long time. Cost saving was, was the main argument for doing digitalization, and that has caused a lot of, let's say, disappointment. So the, the idea here is that we try and switch the, the, the focus of the debate to value delivery as justice systems should do. And maybe if we are uh, if, if we are successful, we might even develop a European minimum standard for digitalization. So that's, that's why we are doing this. And, but in, in 2022, Pascal already uh, told us that that's when uh, the, the, the idea uh, began to take shape. Uh, we had a high level expert group that got together a couple of times online to discuss what actually the project should develop. And this is what came out of those discussions. It should be a statement of values with a guide on how to do it. Analysis focusing on civil procedure and on the articles in the, in the charter and in the, in the convention, based also on the Eli Unitroir. And I think Sandra will talk a little bit more about that later. And the other important pillar would be the OECD criteria for people-centered design of justice services. Focus on opportunities and also, um, pay attention to governance. The governance is becoming more and more uh, an issue in how to develop uh, digitalization. Also, because digitalization by now touches upon the very primary processes of justice systems themselves, not just the back office. So these were the first thoughts. And th this is what came out of those discussions. We're going to do a set of principles as a framework, improving the use of digital technology and focusing on the key values of justice service delivery. We also found that there is already a lot of knowledge and research out there that has never, let's say, been 
been bundled. So it's our ambition to also try and bundle what is already out there. For instance, CEPESH has done a lot of interesting studies uh, that all focus on a specific topic, and we'd like to try and, and integrate those into this overarching framework. Focusing on civil justice, uh, we discussed this. Is, is it necessary to narrow the focus that much? Isn't administ administrative justice so much like civil justice that we that that it would also that we could also focus on that? We decided not to do that, but we do say that probably administrative justice is enough like civil justice that that it could benefit from the thinking that we're doing at the moment. Criminal justice is a very different ballgame with a very different party configuration, different legislations. So we thought that it would be too ambitious to actually try and include them. That's why we ended up with civil justice. So we're coming to the how. And I start with the advisory committee. Um, and I remember when we started putting that together, let's say in the last quarter of last year, that was a really fun job to do because everybody immediately said yes. No one said, oh, that's too much work or this is not interesting. They were all enthusiastic and supportive. And uh, so we had wonderful conversations with them about what they thought we should do. And about three weeks ago, we had a meet an, an online meeting with them. Um, and what, of course, happens with a group like that, they all have lots of different enthusiasms and, and focus points. So this is the, the uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a short list of the overview of the most important points that came out of that meeting. Again, on a potential, but don't, don't forget the risks, they said. Um, they, and a very important point for, for all of us is the human-centric justice, people-centered justice, and communication between citizens, citizens and courts. Data collection is an, actually an emerging topic. Uh, we can now do so much more with data than we could 10 years ago. Comparative differences between countries. Countries is an interest, interesting point as well to dwell on for a second because um, we decided that it's too early to actually try and do country reports. Gathering correct, uh, dependable information about countries is very difficult as the people at CEPESH know quite well. And uh, we thought that, that for now, we, we first need to have a framework in order to know what kind of questions we would want to ask. So it may be that there will be, the, that the framework that we come up with at the end of this project will be helpful to start doing country reports. We don't know that, but we're not doing the country reports now because we think it's really too early. So then, um, but if we do find examples of good practice with evidence of, the, of what, what, they are, what their impact is, we will include them. We will include the CEPESH documents, and there are a couple of other things that uh, the advisory committee thought we should uh, pay attention to. So now, the people who are doing the real work, uh, that's ourselves. We are the reporters. There are four of us. You've seen us already. Um, we have a, we're a nice bunch of, of people of, with different backgrounds and from different countries. We have a couple of ex experts at our disposal for for specific topics, some of them are practitioners, some come from, ju from judicial administration, and some of them are academics. So that's also a nice mix of practical uh, uh, experience and, and people who can do intellectual heavy lifting. And then we also have at our disposal a couple of uh, researchers. Some of them are judicial ref justice reform experts. And again, here we also have a couple of academics and also from very different uh, national backgrounds. So that's the team. And uh, we had a first meeting with them online on June 1st, but last week we had the kickoff meeting uh, actually face-to-face. -face. I think it's really necessary to have at least one face-to-face -face meeting if you have to work so closely together. So here we were at Rot Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So thank you very much, Rot Rotterdam, for the hospitality. We had a wonderful time there. Everything was comfortable and well-organized. And um, we came up with a work plan. So, the what we did, what we did, we first, we started out by set, by asking each each team member what is your key th key theme. And those key themes, you see them here in the picture. 
we, we uh, grouped into what you can call families, and you see the families on the left. So it's the users, again, that's the people-centered justice, open justice, transparency, procedural justice, that includes everything from, from equal opportunities to, to equal playing fields, and uh, uh, let's say also effective uh, case management, and then there is technology, because obviously that in our case, that would be a topic. So those, those were the first things we came up with. And the, at the end of the, of the meeting, after two days, this was the structure of the publication, which what we now think it's going to be. But I've, I've included the question mark with provisional because all kinds of things, in, new insights can come up during the process that we're going to go through and who knows, but we'd like to, if, if possible, the, the, um, the, the, um, this structure actually reflects Article 6.1 in the convention. And we'd like to try and group everything that we do within the values that are in Article 6. But we may, we may need to change our minds at some point. So we are still, we are, among ourselves, we're still debating whether this is the right structure, but we're going to start working with this. So, um, and the last point, of course, we had to decide about the timeline. When are we going to do what? And what we're trying to do is to have a, a first draft for review by December. Um, after, and, and so we've, we have, for ourselves, we have a work plan that works its way from here to December, 2023. And so by that time, we will see what we have there. Uh, this is what, as far as I'm concerned, this is what uh, I think we can say now. It's not a lot, but it is uh, where we are. And maybe Xandra would like to add something. Let me stop sharing this. Is Sandra? Yes. Yeah, I was waiting for the screen to. Uh... Thank you very much, first of all, for uh, the kind introduction, Pascal, but of course, uh, especially to Dory for presenting our project in, in a nutshell, which is a, a challenge. And good afternoon, uh, all. I'm happy to see that so many colleagues are interested in our digitization uh, project that we have recently embarked on. And as Dory has also said, with an excellent and very widely diverse team in, in backgrounds, academic practice, uh, countries and areas of expertise, technical and, and legal. Uh, I also had the pleasure to be involved as a reporter in the big, big uh, ELI Unidroit project that led to the adoption of the ELI uh, Unidroit model rules of European civil procedure in 2020. And in the course of that project, which was initiated at the end of 2013, we of course realized that digitization and artificial intelligence were um, uh, also to be considered and of increasing importance. However, considering the long term of the project, the broad scope also of the project, and the fact that many technical developments were still at a very early age, we decided not to dedicate a special part to it back then. But you will see in the rules of ELI uh, Unidroit on civil procedure that we do, what we did incorporate uh, many uh, rules on digitization, for instance, the use of electronic communication between the court and the parties. Uh, there are rules on e-service of documents, electronic taking of evidence, and also the use of electronic platforms. But also at some of our meetings, we had more fundamental discussions, for instance, about the right to be heard in person rather than through video conferencing, but also about the changing role of the judge in an online environment, and also how to secure open justice, just to mention a few of them. But taking on board also our experiences uh, during uh, the pandemic, the present project provides an excellent opportunity to build onto these rules of uh, the ELI Unidroit project and of course the wider framework of Article 6 and Article 47, as Dory has mentioned. And to reflect on and to provide a, a framework for translating procedural rules and fundamental rights into this digital context. I think it's a very challenging project as we've also seen in our uh, kickoff meetings already, but I firmly believe that the judiciary, the judiciary needs to keep pace with a, a digital society to give citizens access to justice without barriers. And uh, unfortunately, we are sometimes lagging hopelessly behind in many of our countries. 
However, this uh, increasing uh, digitization in the judiciary can only be done in full respect of the right to a fair trial and the inherent fundamental rights. It is our mission to contribute to uh, that with this set of principles. And we're of course, very happy to engage with you in all questions and comments that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know whether Jiri or Masoud, you want to add something as also co-reporters? Yes, Masoud. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, um, thank you for uh, the kind presentation and <clears throat> obviously from uh, Zandra's uh, presentation and also um, Dori. Um, I'm very excited to be on this project. Uh, I'm, I'm coming from the England and Wales perspective on the project. Um, we have, um, I just want to say a couple of things of what's happening in England and Wales very briefly, which fits into the aims and objectives of, of the project and some of the experiences I can bring into the project. Exciting time for civil justice reforms in England and Wales as we move towards a, creating a fully digitized civil justice system with an emphasis on alternative dispute resolution within that process. Um, and we are actively moving towards that uh, realization and our master of the roles, the second most senior judge in our, in our country who is responsible for the civil court, Sir Geoffrey Voss, has a, a very ambitious future vision for the civil justice system in England and Wales, uh, uh, where he sees a fully end-to-end -end digital uh, system. Uh, and he has uh, put forward this idea of the funnel, which means that all civil claims will come onto a, a landing page. Uh, uh, individual uh, necessarily need legal representation, will be able to articulate their claim on the single landing page. Through this funnel, uh, the online sign against to uh, appropriate forms of dispute resolution, which may be, for example, the ombudsman system, or it may be a form of pre-action or pre-dispute resolution, which I will touch on later on as well, can't be resolved at that stage, uh, which is generated and created through the funnel will then transfer into the court process, thereby streamlining the, the pre and also making uh, judicial case active and efficient. Ambitious uh, vision, and there are clearly some major in implementing this vision, including some of the things as Andres mentioned, in respect of rights around open justice, and procedural justice uh, as well. Um, there are very recent developments uh, in the UK, which I need to mention quickly. In order to realize this future vision, the UK Parliament has uh, recently passed the Judicial Review 2022. And what that does is it creates the Online Procedural Rule Committee. And this committee, is going to be responsible for creating and uh, implementing online procedural rules, which will then impact on the uh, tribunal system and also the civil court. Um, and there are three very interesting that I can quickly talk about uh, in, in terms of creating this future digitized system in England. Wales. For the online civil money claims, uh, uh, an online platform for the resolution uh, of uh, low value uh, money claims. So individuals can go onto this platform, uh, not have legal representation. So it's created for litigants in person. Then they can manage online, which has an enhanced focus on ADA becoming increasingly important uh, within this uh, system. Um, and uh, individuals will have an opt-out uh, process within the system in terms of mediation. So they will have to actively opt out. So the idea is the first course of action is to engage with mediation. Um, so we have this system, which is actually quite successful uh, and it ha has been in opera five years. Uh, the other system that we have uh, in operation is Portal which is an online system for professionals. So for legal practitioners to upload uh, legal documentation, which all parties within the dispute can get access to from a central uh, uh, portal. 
uh, and the courts can also have access to those documents as well. Um, and finally, we have injury claim service, which is an online pre-action, pre-court portal against an injury to uh, manage their dispute through the portal and to engage with insurers and defendants the dispute if then they can so we have these very exciting examples of uh, uh, digital platforms uh, being created within the system which could bring the knowledge and experience of working with policymakers with the senior judiciary uh, and with the profession uh, and I also want to make sure that key fundamental human are protected but are also enhanced within the uh, digital system as we work towards a full digitized online uh, civil justice system. Just take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jiri Novak, uh, you have also a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Pascal, for giving me the floor. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, for, uh, thank uh, Dori, Sandra, and, and Masur for introducing uh, the project and the way how we uh, got to this phase, which is still a, an early phase, and uh, all the drafting and all the work is still still ahead of us. But uh, I basically only briefly wanted to mention how uh, I think uh, important it is, and uh, how I'm glad that uh, uh, also legal practitioners are, as, as as me, are part of this uh, project because uh, um, it's uh, it's the practicing lawyers that are. Uh, every day at the court, uh, going to the court, representing parties. And uh, um, it's not a proper way to say that uh, lawyers are standing on the other side. They are part of the process. They are the st stakeholders of, of the judicial process. So I think uh, it is important to present uh, the views of legal practitioners, which uh, that's uh, uh, my uh, or one of my roles uh, here in this in this project. Um, but also, I uh, I feel it uh, important as part of the discussion to mention that uh, uh, it's uh, one of the questions that we have been discussing is where where does the civil justice start? Is it by uh, filing the court action, or is it even before? And if before, when is it? Is it uh, at the at the lawyer's office where the parties come and? Uh, discuss the case with, with the lawyer, and then the case needs to be filed by uh, by court action. And all this is part of a, a process that leads to going to court to be a part of the, the civil procedure. And even this, this part is, uh, and I think it makes sense to be uh, digitized. So uh, uh, I think this is, this is something that uh, we will also be discussing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to to uh, seeing the the outcome of this project because uh, I think it will be very important in shaping of uh, the future of the uh, European uh, civil judicial uh, process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all four of you, of, of course, for taking on this responsibility and of course uh, of being ready to. Uh, uh, get also all the experiences also of, of the various uh, judicial systems in Europe in the broader term, of course. And, and a way to channel all these experiences is, of course, the uh, membership uh, consultative committee. And we have with us the MCC chair of this project, Professor Lorena Bachmeier Winter. And she's a full professor in justice systems and procedure at the Complutense Universidad in, in Madrid. She has written extensively in, in the area of uh, judicial systems and uh, has been also uh, teaching uh, across the world, including in Berkeley, Harvard and Sanford, and works regularly also as an international legal expert for the Council of Europe and other international organizations. So I think she is well placed also to help to channel the uh, um, experiences of uh, the ELI members to the MCC, uh, and as MCC chair, she will now address a couple of words. Um, uh, uh, Lorena, not Verena, sorry. Lorena, you have the floor. 
So thank you very much, Pascal, for the presentation. Thank you, Eli, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to learn from all of you. And thank you all the participants that are connected and linked. And, and obviously, we are waiting also for the uh, Q&As. That's every project. And we just finished another one. So it's really enriching just to listen to the opinions for so many people and experienced ones. So the first thing I have to say regarding your project, I think it's absolutely timely. You're completely right. There has been um, not only the need, but since the pandemic, an absolutely increase. And, and we saw that the um, each member state reacted in different ways. Anyone uh, with the resources they had or the needs they had and the, within the legal framework that constrained everything. But it was clear that uh, by now everyone and every justice system needs to be uh, using the digital tools to a certain level. And this is something that I wanted to discuss with you. What is your aim at the, in, in providing these guidelines? But for sure, for sure, your first aim, which is um, kind of bundle these very dispersed and, and segregated and, and diverse uh, principles and rules that are all over not only the European Union but I would say also in in other jurisdictions uh, just to systematize them and classify them and and select the best practices that would be already a, a wonderful wonderful aim um, regarding the scope regarding the scope when we talk about digitalization there's obviously uh, so to say two levels the one which is handling everything um, the communications, the system of notification, the presentation of papers uh, with the courts. So, and the other one is to go to the full stage that uh, the trial is going to be also online, completely online. And the third level would be uh, in digitalization. Uh, do you go beyond also to the adjudicating phase? So introducing automatized uh, dispute resolutions systems, so algorithmic uh, adjudication by artificial intelligence. So these would be three levels. I would say that in the first level, there's a huge practice implemented, um, I would say, in, in, in not so much old democracies where there has been a huge investment uh, by international stakeholders they have even more digitalized uh, systems than in other very long-standing uh, democracies. But in general, um, notifications, there has been a huge and small claims. There are already many platforms around and in, in the possibility of communications. I talk about my country, myself, uh, experience is that uh, for, we have already almost for two decades the LexNet system in Spain and which is not only the communication between the practitioners, the lawyers and civil suits with the courts, but also it's mandatory. You cannot communicate and you cannot send over papers uh, if it's not through the uh, digital platform. Second, uh, there is the recording, the uh, recording and electronic access to those recordings to every practitioner. In that realm, in the, in the level of communication and access, I would say uh, most countries have kind of a uh, certain advance in, in this area. The problem uh, is the next step. If, if we are going to the whole um, online hearings and so forth. And in that area, in that area, we come across, and you perfectly know because you have discussed about this, but I, it might be good to remind also the rest of the audience. Um, the Certain problems on access and certain problems on security must be absolutely taken into account. You fully know, but I think it's important to draft some principles. The storage, how long, how to ensure that the data protection of the parties, if everything is going to be recorded, who is going to store it? Um, does the, this is something we discuss within a, a certain missions of the Council of Europe, who is going to use the recordings? because data protection rules is for that purpose only, but can you use them as evidence in another, in another um, proceedings? Can the parties that are connected online um, by themselves record it by other means? Is this allowed or not? So um, what about access to other parties? If it's confidential, but who controls that this is in camera and not other parties are listening to the screens? 
and obviously who has the recording device in within the project of the Council of Europe we discussed about the transparency and the relationship between practitioners the lawyers and the judges and, and sometimes they complain precisely the lawyers that they went when they were introducing um, more substantive allegations uh, the judge just muted them no? so uh, it was kind of okay how can we say that the the judge is not respecting our right to fair trial no and um then the next point i the next point i think it's absolutely crucial crucial which is beyond obviously the the legal framework but needs to be addressed by the lawyer by the by the legislative uh and, and within the principles also to be defined is um, as long as everything is digitalized obviously the cyber security needs to be increased um i had the chance to live and to see the number of daily cyber attacks that the Spanish courts are really, really are fighting against. So um, who is going to ensure that cybersecurity, which we would say judiciary or Ministry of Justice, because this uh, can affect also the independence of the judiciary. Who is responsible for a possible hacking of data by these cyber attacks is the judiciary or it's uh, uh, lawyers will, and parties will have to sign a kind of disclaimer because cybersecurity cannot ensure absolutely uh, um, um, security of the online. And finally, we had a lot of problems. And I think this, um, I know these are very tiny rules, but uh, these affect so much on the fairness of the trial and the participation of the parties. You might have thought, obviously, about it uh, before. So if I'm repeating myself, uh, sorry for this. But uh, we had a lot of problems when uh, the deadlines had to be compliant by practitioners in filing some lawsuits and some documents or sharing with, with the parties. But the system was cracked. Uh, so and you face some failure of the system and at the end just the postponement and the and the, the automatic extension while the whole online system is uh, repaired is, is uh, really really addressed a lot of problems of the practitioners and um, obviously um, I'm stopping here because uh, Pascal knows me and I tend to extend myself but I find this project really not only timely, necessary, important, significant, but absolutely fascinating, fascinating because it brings us to another level, which man, some of the countries are already in a quite advanced position, others not. Uh, Sepesh shows us already the uh, complete data on, because it's one of the uh, the questions that I put to the countries and how far they are using IT services and IT communication and how far this is ensuring access to justice. My question, my final question is uh, regarding dual four points, users, open justice, procedural justice, and technology. There's a crucial element. I know it's not for lawyers themselves, but it has to be taken into account. What about the budgetary issues? Because at the end, if there's no enough resources, we can talk about principles and those principles remain in the nice area of heaven and dreams. So thank you for listening to me, and I hope I did not expand, extend myself too much and too long, Pascal. Sorry if it was the case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. In fact, you didn't exceed your time. It was just on time. Thank you very much. But uh, thank you very much for the content, because that's food of, uh, for thoughts and for questions after we finish our roundtable. And, and so we will continue, and then certainly reporters will have a, an opportunity to maybe react to some of the points you have just mentioned. We will therefore continue now with some reflections from the outside, if I can say so, on recent developments in the field, including from Sepej's perspective and the needs for ELS project and its scope uh, in this initial feedback. And that's why I will give the floor to Francesco De Pasquale. Uh, he is currently uh, uh, president of the CEPER since January 2023, having previously occupied the post of uh, vice president since uh, 2019. And he's also a judge, a judge of the superior course in Malta, Malta, namely the first hall of the civil course, having been appointed in April 2019. Uh, he was previously appointed magistrate for the course of Malta in 2011. And he's also the president of the Association of the Maltese Judiciary 
and represent the judiciary in the digitalization strategy group, which is working to implement the digital justice strategy for Malta. Uh, and uh, about, uh, when he finds time, I wanted to say, he still is a lecturer at the University of Malta. So I think the, this is interesting. We said we need to have the perspective of practitioners. So we've heard uh, uh, Jerry, but uh, now we will uh, see also the perspective of a judge involved in this digitalization process. And, and Francesco uh, De Pasquale, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you very much, ELI, for giving me this opportunity as Sepej and also me and my personal capacity. It's indeed an honor to be able to hear from such esteemed and learned academics and even colleagues. And I would like just to give a very short um, introduction to what Sepej is, even for everyone to understand what we are talking about. Sepej is the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, set up in 2002. And it has at its main aims that of the, um, helping in the improvement and efficiency and functioning of justice in all the member states of the Council of Europe, which are 46. And we also have a lot of members, observer states even involved, and we have been working ever since 2002. And its tasks are mainly that of analyzing results of judicial systems, identifying difficulties, defining concrete ways how to improve, and to provide assistance to states and even possibly to provide new legal instruments to help states in issues. Digitalization was recognized by Sepej as being an issue that has to do with justice ever since it started. And it's always one of the questions that we keep on discussing and we always make reference to them in our evaluation reports. We have been doing an evaluation report of all the 46 member states since 2004. We are currently in our uh, 10th addition and um, the questions on IT are ever increasing and I can actually say that the, in the new edition there is a whole very detailed chapter on how IT is being used because we understand that that we need to somehow start getting information. Information is over there. We just need to find out a way how to get it. You obviously start then, as you get information, you start also realizing that we are so many different systems with so many definite ideas behind it. So it is always a very interesting evaluation. Um, uh, one of the things which we did in 2018, which I think is of relevance also to this discussion, is um, we launched we, we published the European Ethical Charter on the use of artificial intelligence in judicial systems and their environment. To be honest with you, when it was launched in 2018, it was still viewed as oh, artificial intelligence. One day, nowadays, we are being proven that 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 sort of, in some way, it was a precursor to many other things that have happened. And uh, we have seen recent developments where the uh, use of artificial intelligence has nowadays uh, rushed ahead. And you have uh, apps like ChatGPT and everything that are being used in every day. And so artificial intelligence is something of today. So I am pleased that in 2018, we had, uh, we had worked on those, on, those, uh, on those principles. The idea was to try to, to be able to find some some basic principles that would be able to help in the implementation of AI in justice systems. And if you allow me just to just to go through the five principles, the first one is the principle of respect of human rights, of fundamental human rights. Uh, the idea is that one has to ensure that the design and implementation of artificial, artificial intelligence tools and services are compatible with fundamental human rights. The principle of non-discrimination. One has to specifically prevent the development or intensification of any discrimination between individual or groups of individuals in the systems. The principle of quality and security. With regards to this, uh, this has to do with the processing of judicial decisions and data using certified sources and intangible data to ensure a secure technological environment, which is something which my colleague before just mentioned, which is which is very dated. Um, the principle of transparency, impartiality, and fairness. One has to make the data processing methods accessible and understandable. You 
we have to go beyond the black box. We have to understand what is happening behind it because that is the only way it is. these systems are transparent. And finally, you have the principle of user control. So the idea is that the users are informed actors and in control of their choices. So one is not imposed upon them how things are done. These compliance, uh, compliance with these principles must be ensured, we insist, in order for the process of judicial decisions and data by algorithms are accepted. The study itself is accompanied by an in-depth study of the use of judicial system. Now, naturally, the use of judicial systems in this study was till 2018, because we, when it was published, it was 2018. However, we did not stop there. In 2019, we developed a toolkit for, this, uh, for supporting the implementation of, of the guidelines on how to drive change in cyber justice. And this toolkit includes an executive summary of guidelines and principles how to drive change, a roadmap to design, to support the design and management of an IT strategy, the, an executive outline how to build a case management system, a checklist on the different steps one has to see, and a grid to evaluate how the projects are developing. In 2019, then, we set up the Cyber Justice and Artificial Intelligence Workgroup which had as its main goal that of evaluating and collecting more information on the various tools being used in cyber justice. And apart from that, also promote guidelines. In 2021, we promoted, we published the guidelines on the use of video conferencing in courts. And uh, these were quite timely for the simple reason that there was the COVID period. So there were quite a lot of issues coming up. And in this, guidelines, there is also um, a list of good practices, how other countries are using video conferencing in their, in their practice. So we try to include also in it what is happening in other countries. In December of 2021, we published guidelines on the e-filing in courts, which is something else, which is always something which is developing. And the idea was to, to deliver a framework on e-filing both for the parties and to ensure an efficient and effective treatment of data. Once again, we also have a list of good practices which has happened all over the other countries. Two weeks ago, actually no, last week, we launched, we published the guidelines on e-judicial auctions. We have guidelines on how judicial auctions can be done in an electronic format, something new, something innovative, something which many states are already using. And once again, we are working now on collecting more information to be able to, to give ideas on good practices. One other interesting thing, which I think I may, I may wish to bring to your attention is in, in March of 2023, we launched a resource center on cyber justice and artificial intelligence being used in all the, the courts within the Council of Europe. The idea is to have a publicly accessible focal point of reliable information on AI systems and, and cyber justice tools which are being used for the digital transformation of the judiciary. This is a works in progress. The idea is to gain an overview of such systems and tools and to be a starting point for further examination. You know, so I look forward to ELI even being able to make use of this information, which we will gladly be able to provide. It is accessible online, but I'm sure we will be able to help you out also. The center brings value to the profession and academic discussion about AI by making it less attract, less abstract, abstract, and more concrete. We are actually going into details how they are being used, and uh, the center considers AI systems in the wider sense. So um, it includes all, it, it includes even the notion of data processing systems, you know, so we go to the whole idea and how data is being used. Um, then there are categories which have to be seen. The categories are, we have systems which deal with document search, review and large scale discovery, systems on automated online dispute resolutions, the prediction of litigation outcomes, decision support and decision making, anonymization, 
e-filing, the triaging, allocation and workflow automation. These are other systems which we are evaluating. The national, the natural language processing, speech to text, which I believe is something which is very relevant, especially to make court systems more efficient. I can talk myself from my little perspective as being a judge in Malta that introducing the system of speech to text in Malta has helped very much in the efficiency of court cases, you know, and the information and assistance services. So we are trying in this resource center to bring together all the different systems which already use this. And the idea is that for whoever wants to go in and see how they are done and what is happening or who's developing, this is a resource center which is being updated on a monthly basis. So we have a whole board who is actually looking into applications and we actually vet them. So I think this is quite an interesting. Last but not least, um, uh, we have then, we in, in, in December of 2021, a bit before you, we launched our three-year plan, which is entitled Digitalization for a Better Justice. And this is where we as CEPEJ are are setting certain goals where we want to help in, in the efficiency of justice by supporting digitalization of the administration and management of courts. We, are, we want to help in the transparency of justice by promoting digitalization to improve knowledge on justice and in particular on the length of proceedings, which is something which worries everyone. And the length of proceedings is something which we try always to improve or, or to help to improve. The issue of collaborative justice, we have to set up tools for interconnectivity between participants in the judicial proceedings. Human justice by supporting judges, prosecutors, their teams, how to work. And people-centered justice, because we always forget this, that justice is not only for the judges, but it is based on the people, the citizens. They are the people who are to benefit from it, so they should be at the, at the center of everything. Naturally, another important point is the informed justice, a justice where people are informed how things are done. And that is where we hope to be able to assist. If I can conclude, because I think I have gone over my yeah. minutes, um, we believe a lot in digitalization and we are there to do whatever we can to help. And I'm sure that we will gladly be able to help out ELI in any way whatsoever to be able to help you out in your great project, which is really interesting indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco de Pasquale, for this very, I almost wanted to say you, you have, have impersonated the uh, resource uh, center by your, your speech. Of course, we uh, at the ELI, when the council took the decision of going for this project, we of course were fully aware of the work of the CEPEJ and the various things that were already there. Of course, some things uh, came later on. Uh, and, and nevertheless, the council and the reporters uh, were of the opinion that uh, there were something more to be done. And, and you too, as you uh, instated a three-year program, so it shows that there is still a lot to be done. And maybe as a first question to launch this uh, section now on, on Q&A, I wanted to ask uh, uh, um, uh, Dori Railing how she sees uh, the interconnectivity or interoperability between what the CEPES da has done and, and does and, and what is in, now envisioned with this ELI project. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you, everybody, for those interesting contributions. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on at CEPES. I know that. Uh, I mean, I've, I've helped CEPES with some of them. And we also, we recruited one of your key figures in the cyber justice group for our advisory committee. So we are fully aware of what CEPES can do for us and maybe what we can do for CEPES as well. So, uh, and uh, Lorena, thank you. You have, you have um, in fact, uh, uh, touched upon a lot of issues that we discussed. Uh, I'm, well, I may be coming back to some of them. Um, <sighs> Let, 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 let me start with the, 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 the scoping questions that, that are you know, fully fully at the forefront. Why not this? Why that? Uh, uh, 
let, let's start with AI because that's what everybody talks about these days. We, we, we had to think about whether we would include AI as a, as a topic when we discuss digitalization. And we decided not to do that for a number of reasons. One reason is there is, there is an Eli project on AI and we didn't want to get into their way. Um, and the second one is that the, the, the thinking and the experience with AI is still so much in development that we felt it would be difficult to actually be able to make statements about it that would hold for let's say the coming five or 10 years. So that's why we decided not to include AI as a topic. But of course, AI is also just information technology, uh, maybe a little more intelligent than some of the other. And the third reason was that um, when, when we look at, 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 at justice systems in Europe, they are all struggling to introduce and implement what I now ten, tend to call traditional information technology. And as long as they are struggling with that, we think they need most help in that area. Um, so those are three reasons why we decided not to include AI as a specific topic in what we do. Um, the, other, the other issue that is actually always in the background is the issue of governance. Who is responsible for what? Who decides about, uh, about security, about uh, what the, the, the functionality of the technology is going to do, uh, also issues like that. And also, of course, about the budget. Now, the problem with governance, uh, or maybe, it, maybe it's not a problem, but the fact about governance of justice systems in Europe is that it is very diverse. Each country, each, each national system has its own solutions, for instance, for, the, the, for safeguarding uh, the independence of individual judges. Southern Europe has different solutions than Northern Europe does. Estonia has different solutions. So it would be very difficult to start and build a model of how that could work. Um, but governance and, and, and the, a question that, uh, that occupies my mind more and more is uh, whether the fact that justice systems are struggling with, with a digitalization is not partly caused by the fact that they are still governed as if they were paper-based institutions. So those are really big questions. And um, I don't know the answer. We don't know the answer to all of them, but this, this is certainly something that plays a role. It's important, but it's also a very hairy topic. Um, so the CEPES has done a lot of re excellent reports on specific topics. I particularly like the one on e-filing because I, I, I read that. I know the people who, who, who put it together and I think it's excellent. But they're all, let's say they are all separate. They are all dispersed. And what we'd like to do is to try and bring them all in within the framework that we're going to develop. So uh, that, would, that would be my idea of, of how we are going to work with what CEPES does. Um, Raymond Asimaitis, mm -hmm. who is on our uh, advisory committee, will certainly remind us of all the stuff that's already there and that we can use. Is that, is that uh, an answer to your question, Pascal? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. And also, uh, yeah, the philosophy of the European Law Institute is not to replicate what others do uh, well, but really to fill in gaps or to try, as you nicely put together, uh, a different perspective in order to have a, a common reflection, bringing some principles, and, and that goes directly into that direction. Uh, as we have a, a couple of questions in the Q&A uh, uh, section, maybe I, I will go through them. And the first comes from Ukraine, and that's an interesting question, I think, uh, uh, where uh, practitioners were led to use the uh, um, uh, the digital system uh, during COVID, and now that uh, uh, COVID is, is has passed, uh, the uh, the government apparently uh, wants to uh, set a, a stop to using the digital system, and uh, uh, the question is. Uh, what of course they say? What is your position? But of course the question is, uh, uh, or behind that question there is the uh, issue about uh, uh, analog, uh, digital and non-digital. Uh, if we go digital, is it everything digital? And what about those who are 
not capable or refuse to go digital and and how can you incorporate that so is there a way back is there a double track and and how do you see things maybe i i give the floor to to dory but if others uh, want to interact you you may also raise your electronic hand so that you can take the floor afterwards um as, as far as non-digital uh, is concerned there there is of course the big access to justice matter for people who are, for all sorts of reasons, not able to go completely digital, uh, but uh, across the world there are there are already solutions to uh, this, this this particular issue. I mean, in a very early phase, the Singapore judiciary set up kiosks where people could uh, could actually interact with the courts. Uh, and what we what we the, the solution we came up with in the Netherlands is that um, yes. You can you can proceed in paper, uh, but inside the court everything is digital. So that would be that's another solution, and that that also raises some issues that I don't want to go into now. Um, so there are, but clearly there have to be solutions for people, particularly because those are the people that need may need legal protection most, uh, and in order for them to actually be able to realize that protection. Thank you very much, Masoud uh, Ahmed. Yes, thanks. Um, just an example from uh, England and Wales. I mentioned the uh, official injuries claim service, uh, which is uh, an online portal essentially for uh, people, uh, small injuries who don't need necessarily need legal representation. Now, one of the key features of uh, that portal is um, a support center where individuals can call uh, a human being and discuss how to use the online portal, how to upload documents, uh, and if they have any other technical issues. The, 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 the center, the human center, it's, they don't give legal advice, but they do help individuals uh, navigate the online, online portal. So we do have some support systems and structures there. One of the interesting uh things about that is i've been looking at some of the most recent data around the functioning of this online portal and one of the interesting things that comes out from from the data is that there has been a huge increase in individuals calling the support center um now that can be a good thing because it means you know people are engaging with the online portal and they are using it and, and you know and they know that there's a support center but the uh, the problem with that also is, I think, uh, that the system may be quite complex uh, and it may be a system which is not necessarily helping uh, individuals without legal representation to navigate the system. So there's also issues around uh, procedural justice, which is a key point uh, that we're going to be looking at and exploring uh, in this project as well. So, so that's an example from England and Wales. And I think, again, it's extremely important that we keep an eye on that and we, we uh, all digital systems take, in, take into account vulnerable individuals who don't have access to online, online systems or if they don't understand the online uh, systems or they, they, they don't have the, the language to understand uh, online portals, uh, that we have safeguards in place. Um, so it, it's striking, it's, it's making sure that we strike that balance. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that Chandra Kramer wants to also react and then Dori. Yeah, just a brief reply to the, the question from Ukraine. Of course, during uh, the pandemic, uh, all or many countries, virtual all countries, had emergency legislation in place to sometimes also uh, making a compromise between still providing some justice and the, the more rigid rules of uh, fully securing fair access and equal access to justice. Now that that is over, I think many countries, and that is also what our project wants to contribute to, is to make it more sustainable uh, and to, to make sure that this access is always there, is always guaranteed, that there is a backup if the system fails. That's also what Lorena mentioned. Of course, there should be legislation in place that simply says, 
if the system technically fails, then you will get an automatic extension. And that should be uh, publicly made available. Should also the website should show, so, sorry, is unavailable. We refer to rule, et cetera, uh, to extend or automatically extend the, the deadline for submission uh, of documents, et cetera. Um, so after the pandemic, now we have, have to make it more sustainable in both securing access, what if there's a failure, but also securing uh, other fundamental rights. And that is so if uh, coming back to the question of Ukraine, of course, in Ukraine, there is still a situation of emergency. So I can imagine that to some extent, some of the emergency legislation and, and uh, uh, flexible rules uh, during a pandemic can still be of use. But of course, also Ukraine, like all countries, have to try and move forward to making this uh, sustainable at some point. Uh, yeah, and not having uh, rules that do not secure access to justice or protection of, of uh, fair trial rules for everyone. So it is a little bit of a step back, that was the question, but I can imagine that, that Ukraine doesn't always want to keep uh, emergency legislation in place and doesn't do justice to fundamental rules of fair trial. Thank you very much, Dori. Dori already. You are muted. In reaction to what Masoud was saying about, about uh, systems that are too complicated, um, a very important access issue is that if you develop information technology for people to use, it needs to be tested from day one by, for, by people who are actually going to use it. Um, so we, we, we developed a, a, an, an online uh, platform uh, here in the Netherlands with the help of a, a, a testing panel from the consumers union. Uh, so we could be sure that once the system was actually working, that it would work for the people that it was intended for. So user testing is, is an incredibly important access to justice issue. Thank you. And uh, Francesco De Pasquale, please. Francesco. If, if I can add to this in very interesting discussion, um, I, um, I always insist we have to look at any system of justice as being centered around the citizen. It is the man in the street who has to have access to the, ju the justice system. Therefore, anything that has to be designed always has to have the citizen at heart. Now, I understand that digitalization is something nice, something that we want to get efficient, that it will help us to be efficient, but we always have to understand and appreciate the end goal of everything is the man in the street. So we need to always have to make it a point that whatever system is designed is simple and user friendly. And my experience, unfortunately, of certain systems or certain regulations or documentation that come out sometimes from some authorities are so bureaucratically complex that even I get stuck in them, let alone the typical man in the street who needs the help of the courts. So the message that we always have to come through, and I'm sure that you, you, you will be harping on it, is that whatever systems are designed, always will have the citizen at heart, and somehow he should always be allowed to have access to justice, whether it's digital or paper, that will be converted digital, or by kiosks, so that someone can go and have his, his service done. But the citizen always has to have a right to access justice. That's my very small contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this is very important. Um, uh, we spoke about the citizen at the heart, but uh, I have a question in the Q&A uh, section, uh, which says, yeah, and we have practitioners. And of course, uh, what about the right to disconnect and how will this right to disconnect interact with the rest? So maybe just uh, as a first aspect, the European Law Institute has a project on the right to disconnect for workers uh, that will be uh, soon adopted by the council and then the members. And you will see that uh, this right to disconnect is conceived in a very broad scope and would not uh, only apply to uh, subalterns uh, uh, employees, but on a much broader perspective at least uh, for the time being, that's how it looks like. So uh, that will certainly have an impact. So I don't know whether uh, uh, I see that Francesco would, would like to react. Uh, no, uh, so it was from uh, before. Uh, uh, so maybe Dory, uh, uh, do you want to say something about practitioners that might uh, through the digitalization need to be, uh, you know, uh, 
aware and connected all the time or will there be also a way to keep the right to disconnect in place? Thank you, thank you. My, my reaction would be ask the practitioners. So what does Jiri Novak think about that? Well, uh, I think that there are two levels. One is uh, right to disconnect from uh, the, the legal work for clients, but we are speaking about uh, the right to disconnect uh, uh, in, the, in the sense of uh, judicial proceedings. So uh, now are we speaking about, uh, let's say the right to disconnect during a uh, court hearing? What happens if uh, someone has to disconnect or for technical reasons uh, would be disconnected? Uh, now, uh, if I would be thinking about the, the, uh, the ordinary or real world, what would happen if uh, a party would need to leave the court hearing? There are some rules for that, but uh, you know, different rules would need to be think of in, uh, for the case of a uh, video conferencing connection to the court hearing. Uh, now, as I mentioned, that, that can be for reasons that are um, uh, for technical reasons, which the, the parties cannot influence, but also for reasons that uh, are uh, voluntarily on the side of, of the parties. And uh, yes, we should also think about uh, rules uh, what should what should happen or principles perhaps yeah and um, yeah another point of view could be the the, the view of uh, the right to disconnect or let's say refuse to communicate with the courts of uh with, to communicate with the courts online or using uh, the digital means should there be a, a right because if there is not this right then we are forcing uh the citizens to be using the digital means but not uh, everyone perhaps has the means to connect uh, in a digitized way, as Francesco mentioned. So uh, there should be a, a balance that we should we should seek. Thank you very much. I see that's Chandra Kramer. Please, yeah. I think we should make a distinction here. Uh, if we are talking about vulnerable people that cannot access the system, then in order to secure access to justice, there has to be an alternative. And also, for instance, in, in some of the, the European rules, you still see, uh, for instance, in a, in a small claims procedure that in principle parties have to agree to having a, a hearing remotely. So you still see that there's some a degree of voluntary, uh, yeah, of voluntariness. But I think we slowly will move past that if we know that virtually everyone has a mobile phone and is on their mobile phone all the time, then I think this problem will slowly disappear. When it comes to uh, the right to be disconnected as such as a right, I think as professionals, we have to make use of the best tools. So in, if uh, uh, access to justice uh, is, is protected, is guaranteed by also having remote systems, then to say, oh, but I today, it's a full work day, but I have the right to disconnect. To me, that would sound a bit strange, both for lawyers and for judges. Yeah, if they have principally something against digitization, then it is very hard to perform in your work because all the time we have to uh, use these tools. So in, in that regard, I think there is a difference between not being able to connect, but you cannot say on a full work day or, or uh, I have to appear in court, uh, but I refuse to do this in any way. I don't have money to travel and I also cannot connect yet. Yeah, then, then, of course, we, we are uh, uh, ending in a difficult conversation. Thank you, Sandra. Of course, uh, if I may just uh, uh, interject here and say that uh, in the project on the right to disconnect, there are a number of uh, you know, consideration, requirements, settings, and so on. And therefore, uh, uh, there might well be that uh, even on a full day, uh, there might be some rights to disconnect according to these requirements. But at the same time, of course, practitioners and lawyers are also supposed to be part of the judicial system. And, and uh, at least in some, uh, in some countries uh, that produce some duties on the side of the uh, practitioners. Now, the question might be whether these duties are still um, appropriate in a fully digital world or whether you have a choice not to be digital or not. Uh, you have no such right not to be digital as a lawyer. And that's, uh, of course, also a question of fundamental rights 
uh, that has to be probably addressed at some point, maybe not in this project, but in, in more general terms. Um, uh, I see that uh, Masoud wants to react, so uh, uh, let's go on with that question. Yeah, Masoud, please. Just, just very briefly, again, experience from England and Wales. We, I spoke about the damages claims portal, which is an online portal for practitioners only. And he allows them to upload documents and access documents from a central system, and he allows the courts to do the same. I, I, I think generally, from, and again, this is feedback from my position sitting on the Law Society of England and Wales, where we're looking at digitization and, and the use of ADR and the reforms. Uh, I think generally the feedback from practitioners is that they are keen on digitization. They want to engage and they, they want the system to work and for it to be efficient. They see the access to justice point and they see how the benefits can be passed on to the client. <laughs> but, the, but the main problem from the data that I've seen and the discussions I've had with practitioners is uh, the issue around interconnectivity between their systems and the court system. <laughs> Uh, because there seems to be major problems around that. There seems to be this idea that policymakers are saying, yes, this is a really great idea. Practitioners, please engage. Practitioners say, yes, it's very good, and we can see all the benefits. But then uh, the, the, the policy side fails because they haven't really practically thought out how the court system and the portals will, will, will interact with uh, private practice in the practitioner system. So, so there's an issue about resources, which someone mentioned earlier on, um, and there's also issues around making sure that those resources are in place, both from the court side and the practitioner side, to make sure that the that the systems work effectively. So I think overall, again, this is purely from from feedback that I've been looking at uh, in in my capacity as 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 head of the law society. Um, practitioners are very keen. It's about it's about making sure the yeah. system works and making sure that the policymakers understand that. In order to uh, uh, try to also answer the other questions that are in, in the Q&A uh, in the time allotted, uh, just Jerry, because you are a practitioner also, and uh, there's a question about advantages and disadvantages of taking ev evidence digitally, and in particular, the video conferencing evidence. You as a practitioner, do you see here a problem? And will that be addressed in the project? Yes, I, actually, this, this question is uh, connected with, uh, with what we just uh, discussed. Perhaps we can call it uh, the right exactly. to Exactly, yeah. But uh, also uh, what was mentioned earlier today was the right to be heard in person. And so what happens if uh, you know, uh, one of the parties uh, really feels that they should be heard in person, that they should appear before the judge in person in their full presence, not just uh, by a video conference, because then the judge can you know, have... Uh, it's a different level of communication. So uh, I, I think that is connected, but that is also connected to the taking of evidence. Uh, now you may have an interview of a witness using a video conferencing tool, but then uh, maybe there will be some pieces of information that you cannot just you just cannot assess just using the the, the video camera. Uh, sometimes you need to see the witness in person to assess whether that person is. Uh, is reliable if you can uh, trust what that person says, uh, how, how that person responds. Uh, sometimes perhaps even questions uh, may arise whether that witness being heard using a video conferencing tool, is there anyone else in the room uh, affecting what the, what, the, what the witness says? But then on the other hand, uh, you may have um, uh, witnesses that are uh, being affected or victims that may be uh, uh, hesitating to appear before the court in person and would prefer to be heard uh, using a video conferencing tool. So you have all these different aspects that uh, should be considered and they can really affect the, uh, the taking of evidence too. And of course, it's not just about witnesses, but also about interrogating parties or experts and so on and so on. Yeah, thank you very much. One has to say that during COVID, all uh, arbitration centers around the world try to have a full checklist of all these issues and attorneys were also very proactive of uh, having, uh, you know, several pages of aspect on how to treat with all these different aspects and whether you would turn the camera around the, the room to show that there is no one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, so there's already a lot of expertise. So I, um, 
uh, we said the project is timely, but of course, uh, there are different level of uh, understanding, as I said, in, in the initial aspect. And there's probably also a way to, as uh, Doris said, to bring all these expertise on the same floor and try to make out something that is also coherent for, for everyone. Uh, as we get to the end of the time, maybe I give you the floor, Francesco, and then I will return to Dari for a last, uh, last word, so to say. Uh, um, if I can add on to what Jiri pointed out on the, the issue of video conferencing, you know, I always come, I always say that I am a lawyer at heart because I was a lawyer before. So for me, you know, I'm a lawyer and even a judge. So I can give you my personal experience of what video conferencing was. And I can tell you that before COVID, we had absolutely no idea what video conferencing was. You have to understand that Malta is a, a very small island. So no one could understand why you need video conferencing in Malta. Now that the COVID came, the only positive thing of COVID was video conferencing because all of a sudden we've discovered the existence of video conferencing. And I fully understand the, the, the concerns that you really, uh, actually pointed out where you have certain people who give evidence because you want to see them you want to you want to see their reaction rea re react but on the other hand we have found it very useful when it comes to experts because when it comes to experts you don't need to get an, uh, the reaction you know you know you have an expert person on the other side so when for example we have doctors professors uh, architects you don't need to stay getting them to court to give evidence you can just get in touch with them directly and they can give evidence for over there and that has proven to be very efficient and very advantageous to the system one other thing which i can tell you from our, my experience is that, for example, in Malta, we have quite a lot of international cases with foreigners. And for everyone to come down to Malta, that's quite a hassle. So we have had many issues of cases being delayed for a long time because witnesses don't come. With the advent of video conferencing, we have cases nowadays that can be heard in one day, which for us is quite a big thing because everyone can go online. So yes, there is the advantage of video conferencing, and I am, I am pushing it quite a lot. But obviously, one has to always be careful that if someone has a right to give evidence and wants to do it in person, he should always be assured that right. And if he wants to come, he comes in court. Thank you very much. And indeed, Malta is certainly a very uh, nice place to go to. And so uh, even if it's uh, on digital uh, evidence to be given, uh, people might uh, decide to go to Malta as well. Uh, Dori, uh, I give you the floor. This has been a fascinating discussion that went in all sorts of directions. Um, and th th there's something I'd like to come back to, and that is that um, let's, let's say that in the past 15, 20 years, digitalization has been very much uh, uh, debated and, and implemented even as a means to economize, to make uh, um, justice services cheaper for the taxpayer not necessarily for the people who needed the justice. And, but now, I think we've now come to a point where we've realized the disadvantages of doing that. And we, I, I can see the, the focus actually shifting towards, to, towards what the users actually need. Um, and I think that, that, it, that if, if we can make that, that shift, we will connect, we will actually be able to be more effective in delivering justice value. Um, and that this is something that comes back in almost every discussion that we had as well. Um, do we, uh, for instance, um, uh, do people have a right to be in front of a, of a human, to appear in front of a human judge? Well, ask them, uh, what experience do they have? What, what experience have we actually had with video conferencing? Uh, my, my favorite example of something that has actually improved access to justice enormously, that is appearing in police court in the US, they've, they've, their experience has been that it's much easier for people who have to go to police court to actually do that online, because they don't have to tell their boss they need a day off, they don't have to take a day off, all they need is, let's say, 10 minutes on their phone. So the default judgments in those small criminal cases have gone down dramatically. Uh, that was an unintended effect. So the other thing to be aware of is unintended effects, things that happened that we did not expect, but that somehow improved access to justice somehow. So the, to, for me, the users are the key uh, point to look for and to ask the users and to have them test the systems so they will be effective. And uh, for me, that would be a nice note uh, to end this discussion on, unless one of my colleagues would still like to add something. 
I think we will uh, we will uh, close. I, I will just <clears throat> say a couple of closing words. Maybe first of all to uh, to thank you all, uh, dear panelists, uh, for taking the time and uh, putting up your experience also. Uh, in sharing ideas and reflecting already on this uh, project that still has to uh, deliver, of course, but uh, that will certainly benefit a lot also from this kickoff webinar, I'm sure. Um, I, I want also to stress for those who are online and participants, first of all, thank you for taking the time on your lunch break to join us uh, for this, but also because it will be recorded, uh, you can, of course, share the uh, good news and and also the link of these recordings later on, because that might be useful, but share also the fact that you can join the uh, membership consultative committee. And that's a way also to bring in your expertise, your understandings and comment the various drafts. Uh, uh, finally, uh, we, we see that uh, there is a lot of different levels of digitalization of these civil justice systems in Europe and, and, and beyond. And, and so one might uh, think, uh, is there still a need uh, for some principles? But that would be the same question as someone would say, there's uh, many uh, civil codes in Europe. Uh, is there a need for the draft common frame of reference or some you know, uh, a more uh, coherent uh, system? And the answer is, of course, yes, there is a need of harmonization, maybe, of uh, setting up some principles that ensure interoperability between all these systems and of course also of making the various participants aware of what exists and what does not in some specific legal systems and giving advice on how to go uh, forward. At least that's my, my hope and my vision also for, for these projects to go forward. So uh, I, I just want to say uh, again at the end of this uh, webinar, Thank you to everyone. Thank you uh, really uh, warmly to all the panelists and also good luck and, and uh, enjoy your work uh, uh, all for uh, um, um, reporters. Uh, of course, the interaction with the advisors, with the MCC will, I'm sure, give you a lot of further ideas uh, and you expect to be quick in delivering uh, things. Of course, there's a lot already out there, but at the same time, I, I hope and I fear that you, you might uh, need more time because there's so much to digest and people will be so enthusiastic about this project that they will, you know, flood you with ideas and, and it will not be an easy task probably to uh, find the, uh, the way uh, forward, but I'm sure you're apt enough to do it. And so uh, welcome uh, to uh, the uh, future output. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.